The message today is set the tone, and it is for every one of us in this room, and it's also preparation for what will be a service unlike we've ever had, which happens this Wednesday. Unlike we've ever had because of how we planned it, but above that, unlike we've ever had because I think there's an expectation in the atmosphere of our church that has us ready to see the greatest move of God that we've seen in the history of our church. Amen. I was raised in South Arkansas and summers were like the summers of Oklahoma, very hot seasons, often very dry. Thank God for the last few days. It's been so awesome. But you're well aware of those seasons, long and hot and dry. And as a kid, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather, and he raised a huge garden. So we were outside a lot. And I have many memories, very specific, of where he would be working hard, and he would just stop and say, it's about to rain. And I'm looking around, and there may be a cloud, but, you know, no real indication that it's going to rain. I said, how do you know it's going to rain? He said, I can smell the rain. I didn't know that rain had a fragrance until he taught me. And somehow the, the front that was moving in, the moisture in the air mixing with, like, the dust, he said, it's about to rain. And it did. And if you've been in that context at all, you know you can smell the rain. Well, in a spiritual context, I smell the rain, church. It's about to rain. Things are mixing together. Come on. Things are merging together for such a time as this. There is a fragrance of expectation in the atmosphere. And I'm not just looking to God for something that is going to create a period or season of fresh life, but a generation-shaping move of the Holy Spirit. Any great move of God that you study always confronted a cultural moment. The great moves of God went beyond that moment, but they always addressed the moment. In the great awakening in the 18th century that swept across Europe and then into the American colonies, it literally shaped American Christianity. But it also confronted what was happening in the moment. And so when you study it, you see that as the church gathered, the Holy Spirit was profound, was being outpoured. And the result was personal transformation. And as the church moved into their future, living in that change. And here's a, here's a key thing God's put in my heart. He wants to bring a fresh move of his Holy Spirit, not so that we're better, but that we're changed. You know, seasons that have some refreshing, you can be better, but the trial hits again and often we're back like we were. I'm not talking about just being better, but changed. And as we carry the witness of that change, that is what will address the cultural moment. We need a move of God that is marked by peace for all of the anxiety. We need a move of God that's marked with wholeness for all of the brokenness. I stand in faith, confidence, with excitement on the Word of God that Generation Z doesn't have to be labeled as this age of anxiety. Do you see these fifth graders? The devil is not going to label them, identify them by brokenness and fragility, but we are going to see the Holy Spirit build them. Come on. Build them into like a Joshua generation with a Caleb spirit, Daniels in a Nebuchadnezzar world. Help me right there. Come on, we are the church. We have an answer. And the move of God will, will be specific in meeting the need of the moment. But also, I think it can shape generations. Thank you, God. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12 it says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. What would it be like to experience a move of God where you would say, it's like God is raining righteousness 
Do we need a reign of righteousness in our culture? Do we need a reign of righteousness in the church? Come on, let's come expectant. Now, what are we, what are we taught here? We're taught about the law of sowing and reaping. If we sow, what are we sowing? We're sowing surrender, humble, honest, authentic surrender. That's breaking up the fallow ground. That is not uh, putting, putting on and just going through the motions. That is looking at neglected ground of our heart, cluttered ground of our heart, messed up ground of our heart. And in prayer and in surrender, we start breaking up that ground. It's saying, God, I need you, desperate for you. God, I'm coming with a heart. I'm cultivating, I'm consecrating myself. And what we reap is the rain of righteousness. If we will so surrender, we will reap the greatest move of God that we've ever seen before. If we will come with surrender, it's like the sacrifice on the altar. And there is always a gift of God in response to sincere sacrifice. It says... It is time to seek the Lord, for it is time. That in the Hebrew is God's high time. I believe there are many indicators that this is God's high time. I feel to speak this right in this moment. I didn't do it in the earlier service. I feel an inspiration here. When God said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, he is showing the world was ready. Now, a world in sin doesn't look ready. But Jesus gives us a different way of seeing the moment. And he says, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. So then he said, I want you to go. And he gives the great commission. And he says, you've got to move to the upper room so that you will have the power for the commissioning. Because the world is ready. And if the church is ready... Do you see it coming together? If the church is ready, the world is ready. You say, Pastor, I don't see anybody that is far from God, you know, asking a lot of questions of how to know Jesus. You got to see it the way Jesus sees it. This world is as messed up as it has ever been. Therefore, it's ready for a church that is clothed in power and can come with clarity about who the answer is and how you experience the answer to change your life. Come on, let's be ready because the world is ready. So let's expand our capacity of readiness, of preparation now and for Wednesday and going forward. Psalm 150 verse one says, praise the Lord. I'll stop with that first sentence. It doesn't suggest that we praise him. It doesn't ask if we're willing to praise him. It is a command. I hope that God has been so good to you that he would never have to command you. But it is a command. I'm okay for those times that we're going through the deep, dark valley. And like David in one of his Psalms, he said to his soul, bless the Lord. Soul, bless the Lord. It's like he didn't have the feelings of praise, but he commanded his soul to praise. By the end of the psalm, he uses the same language but a different Hebrew word. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul. It has become the flow. It has, he had praised his way to praising. He had worshiped his way to worshiping. He had praised himself into a breakthrough of fresh power. And there are times where praising him, we are following the command. But we get to that place where we're overwhelmed because praise, it doesn't change God. It changes us. And we gain new perspective on the goodness and the power and the promise of God. And we praise through our tears. We praise through the pain. We praise through the season because there's someone greater than current circumstances. And that's my anchor. That's the unshakable force of God in my life. Come on, take a second. Take a second. We're going to break through today. 
expanding our capacity. Praise the Lord, because the number one reason we exist as believers is to worship God. If I said, what's our number one purpose, we may be tempted to say, reach the lost. That's a good answer. It's just not what's first. The teaching comes from the Old to New Testament. There were just a few priests in the Old Testament who could move into that Shekinah presence of God. And they teach us that before they could go minister to the people, they first, they first had to minister to God in worship. If they didn't minister to God in worship, they had nothing to offer the people. And when you come into the New Testament, God raises us all to the label and identification as ministers, which means you don't have to go through anyone to access the presence of God. You don't have to come to me and say, could you seek God for me? I'll pray for you. But you have direct access. You have the same access that any Christian has, any pastor has. You have the access that Paul had. You as a believer, because of the work of Jesus, you get to come with boldness to the very throne of God. So you are minister and we follow the pattern. We first worship God, then we actually have something to take to the people that are around us. We exist to worship God. He's God alone. His glory is higher than the heavens. He has no equal, no rival. There's no one else like him. There is no one else beside him. He is God of gods. He is king of kings. And when we come Wednesday night, we are going to have an audience of one, Jesus Christ, king of kings and Lord of lords. Let's talk about some posture and and how we worship. Psalm 47, one says, clap your hands, all you nations, and shout to God. You've been clapping, that's worship. You've been lifting your voice, that's worship. Psalm 134, two, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. And this word lift, it, it's not mechanical, like, okay, I should lift my hands. It's, it's an overflow of what's happening in your heart. If you're a sports fan, you've been at any game and you're cheering for your team and they do something you like, oftentimes you're like, like you, you didn't even think about that. You're just like, yes. This word lift is like releasing an arrow. It's like, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. And, and we got to get out of this, this going through this mechanical thought process. I clap because he's good. I shout because he's good good. I lift my hands because he's good. God is so good. Put a praise right there. God in his grace is amazing. Psalm 149 is the picture of 38,000 Levites. The Levites were the musicians and the singers, the worshipers, the worship leaders. And they come with this experience for Israel and when they came with their instruments and their voices, there was like this merger of the spirit of God with the worshipers. And it was like combustion and it ignited something dynamic, powerful, and even loud. There are those times where we need to break the alabaster box of our story. We do at times praise from command but in Psalm 149, as the Levites are leading, people move from command of praising him to praising out of their story of God's grace to them. It's where you break the alabaster box and in your unbridled giving of worship, some may say that's extreme, like they said when Mary broke the alabaster box. Some may say that's extravagant, like that's so expensive. Isn't there a better use of all of that extravagance? And Jesus spoke up. And Jesus said, those who are forgiven much love much. He said her action would be remembered. It would be recalled. It would, it would stand as an example. And so I would say today in August 2024, haven't, if you know Jesus, haven't you, haven't we all been forgiven much 
Where would we be? Let me tag into that song that Pastor Garrison opened the service with. I love it because I am now dancing on the grave, the song says, that I once lived in. See, I remember my grave. I remember my darkness. I remember my despair. I remember my bondage. I remember my hopelessness. But I had one who came to me and he lifted me up. We're about to praise him here in a minute. And now I'm dancing. See, I know that story. Does anybody know how God found you, how God saved you, how God, anybody want to dance on the grave you used to live in? See that, come on, take a praise break. His mercy endures forever. The goodness of God has found us and saved us and changed us. We give you a clap offering of praise, Lord. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Breaking that alabaster box. There are different marine bases around. There's one in North Carolina. And when the fighter jets are doing their exercises, they will take off and it's right near a very busy road. And people who aren't aware, they are startled by the noise. And so they have this amazing sign. And the sign says, pardon our noise. It's the sound of freedom. Help me, church. Come on, start clapping. Pardon our noise. Have you got a shout? Come on, pardon our noise. What is it? It's, come on. It's the sound of freedom. He saved me. He raised me. He turned me around. He filled me with the Holy Spirit. He healed me. He's given me breakthroughs. He's brought me all the way. If it had not been for the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. Psalm 22 says, when we praise the Lord like this, that he dwells in the praises of his people. And the teaching there is it's like all of heaven looks over at an atmosphere where people are coming with praise out of command and testimony. All of heaven looks over and God says, I'm going there. And suddenly the place that was one of the everywhereness of God is captured up in the manifest presence of God. And he begins to disperse a blessing where somebody who may need healing or someone who needs freedom or someone who needs peace. What happens when we praise, we create a throne and it's like, Jesus on that throne and we're sitting at the feet of Jesus. And what happens for us at the feet of Jesus is what happened for those in the New Testament. They were just caught up in the goodness and the glory. They were given healing and direction and wisdom. Their lives were changed because when God begins to manifest his presence, he starts dispersing it. Technically, in those stories of the feet of Jesus, he administers the power of his kingdom because he's got his sons and daughters in focus and he begins to give you what you need. He starts supplying all of our needs out of his riches and his glory. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy, I smell the rain. You tell me what more do we need than the presence of God? Tell me what else is even close to working. So thank God we have his presence that will be our portion, our supply, our power. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I just got to stay here for a minute. Thank you, God. God, we want a generation shaping move. We want a move of God that doesn't just make us better, but changes us, 
changes us, changes us. I want to put this in the atmosphere right now. I'll come to it at the altar. God wants to do something that's permanent. A lot of stories are there were periodic changes or periodic improvements, but then things went back to the way they were. God is about glory to glory to glory. God wants to heal somebody of their backsliding. God wants to heal somebody of the spiritual roller coaster. God wants to do something permanent. Permanent. They were instructed to build the temple and of all the columns that would support the structure, there were two that had no no structural support. They weren't built for that. They weren't designed for that. They were simply there for messaging. Messaging. And as you came through those columns, you had Jakin, Jakin, J-A-K-I-N, that name on one and Boaz on the other. Jakin in Hebrew means established. Boaz means strength. And as you would come in, you read Hebrew from left to right or from right to left. And as you came into the temple, you were coming into a context of established strength because God was present. And as worship happened and the conclusion came, you walked out and again, you would read it from right to left and now you've got strength established. So you didn't leave the way you came. You came into the context of established strength, the dwelling of God, and you left and your strength was established. And the move of God that's gonna change culture because culture is so fragile, they reach for what they think will work and it doesn't and they just end up with less of themselves and there's so many questions and there aren't any answers and it's just so broken and into that despair moves a church that has their strength established, not ours, it's God's. And we have this personal constitution about us that is built by the promises of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And you, you move into that context and the contrast is so, so distinct that it creates a question. And then because you're clothed with power, you are now giving a witness in season, a word in season, an empowered witness, and people come from darkness to the same light. Wednesday night, we're gonna come into established strength and we're gonna leave with our strength, our strength, Holy Ghost strength, Holy Ghost power that is established in us for the influencing of our community. As I prayed about how I could close this in just the way the Lord had it, he first stirred in my heart. He said, I'm, I want you to lead people in a never again praise. And he led me, he said, this is what I'm talking about. Exodus 14, 13, reading from the King James Version. Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. I love every word of that. You will see them again no more forever. Can you say it with me? You shall see them again. Message paraphrase. Moses spoke to the people, don't be afraid, stand firm. Watch God do his work of salvation for you today. Take a good look at the Egyptians today or you're never going to see them again. It ends today. So somebody gets to offer a never again praise. One of the Hebrew words for praise is Shabbat. And it's a holy roar. 
And God says that roar of praise is going to rise out of somebody's heart who finally watches that, that Egyptian, that, that it, that thing, that fear, that addiction is going to die at the altar. I'm putting a period at the end of the sentence, says the Lord. And the new chapters will not hold the recurrence of that issue. It will only hold the testimony that in August of 2024, it died at the altar. And I'm living in a never again praise. I'm going to work this for a minute because it's not an easy thing. Because if you've been around church for any period of time, you know those things that we pray about and we think we have the victory and then they, they circle back. It's like we left it at the altar, but somewhere that thing got off the altar and got back in our mind and our thinking and our life and our path. What we walked in so much improvement, we were so much better and, and now I'm coming to the permanent versus periodic. I want to move of God where the victory doesn't stop when the trial hits again. The trial will hit again. The temptation will hit again. That thing that wants to threaten your victory, it will threaten again. The difference is that your victory was not periodic. It was permanent. And now, by the authority of Jesus operative in your life, you're going to keep walking in that freedom for where the Spirit of the Lord is. Where the Holy Spirit is. Where God makes His dwelling. Say, Pastor, you're stretching it, aren't you? This is Moses, Old Testament passage talking to people about Pharaoh and and he destroyed Pharaoh. All that. Okay, Moses said to them before it even happened, the enemy you see, there they are. You will see them no more forever. He had no cross to point to, no empty tomb. You and I have a cross and an empty tomb. What does that mean? That means whatever that is that has threatened you and defeated you, that has addicted you, Jesus took that to the cross and he defeated it at the resurrection. He defeated sin and Satan, death and hell. And there is one name that is above every other name. And the authority of that name is, is built by the power of the shed blood, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus and the spirit that raised him from the dead. No one else like him and he sits on a throne of invincible victory and you as a believer get seated with him and you have the power to walk in freedom. Come on, Holy Spirit, and break the bondage, break the snare, break the despair, break the spirit of fear. Set your people free, God. Oh, I feel it. Said never again. It dies at the altar. Come on. It's a roar of holy praise because he set me free. I'm going to walk into my future one year from now, five years from now, and say from that Sunday forward, never again. And I believe in God's power to do that. I believe it, and it needs to be spoken in a generation where self-help prevails, where in the American mentality, we are self-made. We will figure it out. We'll go to somebody, read some book, attend a seminar, follow this formula and these steps. There are some things that only God can do. And if self-help would work, we wouldn't need any more self-help books. And I'm not trying to rain on that. I'm just trying to get us to a, to a foundational need. We need to get back to trusting God. The arm of flesh can't set you free. Put your faith in the righteous right arm of Almighty God. 
Come on. He will lift a spirit of heaviness and he will give you a garment of praise. He will come to that grave you've been living in. He'll lift you out where you're dancing on the grave. I'm so done with all the addiction, all of the depression. Come Holy Spirit, we need you to do what only you can do. Hallelujah. Remain standing. Worship team, come. Listen to these words and join me in it. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the tremble and dance. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him. Praise him. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the... How about a roar? How about a clap offering? Come on. That's God right there. How about a shout? Hey, let the redeemed... Come on, come on, somebody. Make this the very habitation of God. Clap your hands. Worship him. Consecrate your heart before him. Thank you, Jesus. Worship team coming on out here and helping me. Here's my first altar call. I have two. Here's the first one. Say, I need something to stay at the altar. I need it. I need it. Man, my heart is reaching to you and reaching to God for you. I'm going to stand in a place of faith and say it ends today. It ends today by the power of Jesus. You say, you are talking to me, whatever it is, from fear, whatever, addiction, however long, but pastor, you just have to know how many of these kind of altar calls I've answered. And I get my hopes up. I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm not coming to you based on our circumstance. I'll look at me for a second. I feel this. When Peter was asked by Jesus to cast out into the deep and to throw out the nets, he says, Jesus, I'm a professional fisherman. I fished all night. That's when you fish. I fished where fish are. We can't catch fish in the day. We won't catch fish where you're telling us to go. Everything about his experience said it couldn't happen. Your experience may tell you you'll never change. Because if you were going to change, you would have been changed by now. Who am I talking to? If you would have been, if you were going to change, you would have changed by now. But see, your experience tells you you can't change. But see, Jesus was the one who makes fish and makes water. And Peter did something that I hope we'll do. God, everything in me says it can't happen, but at your word. One verse says, nevertheless, but there's the word, nevertheless, at your word, we're going to do this. And you know the story. His net started to break because of so many fish. His boat started to sink. And if he had just relied on his history, he would have never experienced the word becoming Reality. I'm saying to somebody, no matter how long it's been, the tears you've cried, the prayers you've prayed, the things you've done to seek freedom, I stand here today and say, the word of the Lord is, step out one more time. Cast that net of prayer one more time. At the word of the Lord, will you just take him at his word? God, I pray for those people who need a never again praise. They need you to bring freedom. They need you to bring a stop to this. May they respond as the team sings. If that's you, begin to come.